Okay, students, um, I am back. And this is part two of Dr. Harris explains lesson and curriculum planning as exemplary teachers do it. Okay, so in part one, we um, explored a little bit about um, the how the three levels of um, or the three principles of exemplary teaching um, correlate with uh, Dr. Mohammed's uh, four elements. So um, let me just get started by um, sharing my screen with you. Okay. And so if you remember, we talked about in part one, um, these three principles that Dr. Ladson Billings talks about that all exemplary teachers do. They foster high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, and then high levels of critical consciousness or that so what factor, okay? And Dr. Mohammed calls that criticality. So um, her framework is called historically responsive literacy. And I, sometimes I wish she wouldn't have used that word uh, literacy because a lot of people um, these days think about literacy as just teaching reading or language arts. And that's not what she's talking about. She's talking about literacy as this more um, robust form of education in the sense if I'm a literate person, I know how to use my learning and knowledge to troubleshoot, even if it's a situation I've never been in before, because I've got this kind of liberal uh, foundational education, not liberal as in um, Republican Democrat, but liberal as in it's um, a well-rounded, like a liberal arts uh, education. Okay, so we talked about that. And um, so now I want to um, bring uh, Dr. Timon's um, uh, framework into the picture. And um, the reason that I'm doing this is because I'm trying to help you to see what do these three principles of exemplary teaching mean as we translate them into uh, the classroom practice? What do we actually put on our lesson plan? Okay, so um, with Dr. Muhammad, we learned that it is um, high levels of academic achievement. That means we're talking about skills, we're talking about intellect, um, and then high levels of cultural competence. That's when we're taking um, who we are as people start with the learner, not the lesson plan. What is the learner's identity or identities? You know, we all have more than one identity and they intersect with each other. For example, for me, um, you know, my identity as a woman, my identity as being white, my identity as being middle class, as a college graduate, um, as a primary speaker of English, uh, those are all um, factors that intersect and help to form my identities. And then the last one, criticality. This is where students are looking around and they're looking at how things matter in the world. So for example, in our module on language differences, we um, talked about how um, when people are are using a dialect of English, or maybe even speaking in a different register of English, there's some registers and some dialects that are considered to be lower status. Like if I went to a job interview and, and I asked the question, who dat? Um, people might make assumptions about me as not being very intelligent, that I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know how to be professional. Um, and so, they would want me to say, uh, who is that? And that would be considered, quote, standard English. But the criticality part of that is that there, nothing came from the heavens that said, uh, you must use who is that rather than who that, 
you know, but one is lower value, lesser valued, and the other is considered normal or the normative standard. But who decided that? You know, actually they're kind of arbitrary. So this criticality would look at that, at that unevenness of what is considered um, normal and the quote proper. And that would be the ideology of uh, language standardization, that there's a good way to speak language and then there's a bad way. And if you say who that, that's in the bad side. So um, uh, children often realize that um, certain ways of speaking are not as um, valued as others. So you're going to deal with that in criticality. And as a teacher, you're going to want them to learn to walk in both worlds here so that they know when and where they can say who dat and then when and where they should say who is that. Um, even though we know that um, really both are, are grammatically about communicating, but one has is seen as the proper or standard way. So um, even though they didn't come from the heavens like that or from under the sea like that um, on scrolls or tablets or something, um, nevertheless, our society values one over the other. And we help children to learn to walk in both worlds by talking about that, not saying that one is better than the other, but talking about it. So um, Dr. Mohammed's um, skills, intellect, identity, and criticality are matching up with Dr. Ladson Billings, academic achievement, cultural competence, and then the so what factor of criticality. Okay, so whenever you're lesson planning, do you have in your lesson and in your curriculum unit, do you have these elements? Did you address skills? Did you address intellect? Did you address identity? Did you address criticality? If you did, then you're also addressing these three over here that are from Dr. Ladson Billings. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, Dr. Timon's eight principles of enduring learning. Okay. Um, and, you know, I do have that um, tendency sometimes to reverse letters, numbers, and words, and I did it right here. Um, Dr. Timon's framework says enduring principles of learning, and I have it principles of enduring learning. So that's something that I have to try to be aware of so that I don't confuse you with that, but just be aware that sometimes I do um uh, reverse things. Um, so Dr. Timon, she's got these eight principles and then we started talking about them. Um, what are they? And then how do they line up with the, our chart over here? So let's look at principle one. Her principle one is called joint productive activity. Uh, teachers and students are producing something together. They're working together to create something, okay? So it might be the, a teacher in a small group of students working on something that they're creating together, um, building, learning together. It might be the teacher and the whole class doing something together. I know with um, my second graders, I had a lot of English language learners and I would have a big chart paper and I would use their um, experiences to write a um, class story. So we would create a story based on their experiences together. That was our story. And so we were creating something together. Um, it can also be students working with other students working together to create something, but the point that they are producing something. So it's joint, that's the working together, productive, they're producing something, and they're active, it's, it's an activity. Um, principle two is about language and literacy development. Um, so developing language and literacy across the curriculum. Um, if you think about, um, Math, uh, for example, we have words like add, subtract, equals. So there's all kinds of vocabulary words and ways of asking and questions and saying things that are pertinent to math. 
And same thing in science, we have words like hypothesis, data, um, experiment. So we have different uh, vocabulary sets with each discipline. So in principle number two, we would be developing the competence in the language and literacy of instruction across the curriculum, okay? So um, they're going to be reading, writing, um, listening and speaking, using language and, it, and to develop their curricular knowledge. Um, this one, it, principle number three is contextualization. So this should be, this is the one where it's, it's connecting to the students' lives. It makes sense to the students. Um, I know for me, uh, when I was a child growing up, I did not come from a family that um, were very active or talked about sports much. So when my teachers would use examples that came from the world of sports, it went right over my head because I didn't know what that meant. I didn't have any contextualization for that. Um, but if I link it to the student's knowledge, for example, my own students regularly went back and forth from Mexico and they knew how to um, convert uh, the money from Mexico into U.S. money, dollars and coins. Um, I could refer to something that was uh, that they knew about to make it um, contextualized to their own lives. Um, in Utah, you often will see a boat on the back of the pickup being pulled by in a, on a trailer. So that would be something that would be um, contextualizing it for them as compared to say um, a harbor. That's not an experience that a lot of kids in Utah know what a harbor is. They can learn about it to be able to walk in both worlds, but they we don't have harbors in Utah. So to contextualize it, I might have to um, connect it to something that they do know, maybe the Wasatch Mountains, maybe Bryce Canyon, um, something that they know about, maybe hunting. Um, so it has to connect to their backgrounds. Uh, principle four is challenging activities. It's got to be about complex thinking. So a lot of times kids just fill in the worksheet, even if they're in high school, they're just writing down vocabulary definitions. So if you think about Bloom's taxonomy, uh, recall, um, the, those are very low levels of, of, um, of thinking. And so you want the higher order thinking like um, analyzing, evaluating, applying. Those are all higher order thinking skills which require the lower level thinking skills too. There's nothing wrong with trying to get recall, but if everything that you do is like you, you say something and the students are supposed to spit it back to you, you ask them a question and you know the answer, and then they're trying to give you the correct answer that's like recall. And so that's fine, but it should be that you have a lot of higher order thinking where they're actually applying, evaluating, creating. Um, those are complex thinking. Okay, principle five, instructional conversation, teaching through conversation. Um, this one, I really think about um, like, uh, when I was teaching my children how to tie their shoes. And so I would say things like make a bunny's ear and then bring the other one, the other string around and then push it down the rabbit hole and pull it out the other side and then make the two bunny ears tight. So I'm talking through how to do a skill. Um, I might be almost like coaching um, something I might say, okay, now, now, where, where does the number in the ones column go? Where now, if I need to make that into a, a, something in the tens, what do I have to do? And so I'm using my language, my words to kind of coach as a talk aloud, how students should do something. So I'm using my conversation, my words to teach, direct, give feedback. No, that's too far over a little bit more to the right. Um, what did the what did the author say? 
And how do we knew, know that? And so I'm like using conversation to guide the learner to where um, the, the learning objective is. Okay, then principle number six, critical stance. Teaching to transform inequities, empowering students to transform society's inequities through democracy and civic engagement. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but really that one is the criticality. When they look around and they say, well, you know, why doesn't our neighborhood have um, fresh vegetables and fruit? Um, uh, we have a word for that. It's called a food desert. You know, they might look at that and they might say, well, how come um, our girls sports don't get as much um, attendance as the boys do? And so um, that's where we look at the criticality, the um, inequities. And kids are pretty quick to um, be able to observe things. And sometimes they'll say it and it'll be about us as teachers. They'll say, well, why can you all have snacks in the classroom, but we can't? And so they'll notice things like that. And you actually embrace that and, and help students to develop skills to do that as well, um, to work against them. And principle seven is modeling. Um, this is very, very helpful for many learners, especially if they're learning English as a second language, because they may not always have the, the vocabulary. I know for me, when I am speaking in Spanish, I can do BICs pretty well, basic interpersonal communication. But then when I need to be um, using kind of sophisticated concepts, I feel like and I sound like I am a five-year-old because my vocabulary isn't that extensive. And so, and I don't always understand the specific um, vocabulary from that discipline. So if you show me how to do it, then, um, and I can watch you doing it, I'm going to feel more confident trying it myself. So modeling is a very good way to do it. Um, principle eight is student directed activity. And so this is more about where students are choosing their own activity. So you as a teacher may give them a range of choices, but they are the ones who decide within that range what, they're, what they would like to do. So um, sometimes teachers don't intend to do this and then they get caught where they'll say something like, um, should we do spelling? And then the students say no. And so you set yourself up for failure there if you really did intend to do spelling because you just gave them that choice. But principle eight is where students actually have choice in what they learn and how they learn. And as um, the adult in the room, you are the one who sets up the parameters of that and um, guides them in making choices. So how do we put these uh, eight principles into our chart here? What can we say about principle number one, uh, joint productive activity? Um, that one we probably would put here with high levels of um, academic achievement, right? So we're, I'm going to put um, joint productive activity, um, and that's principle one, okay? And um, then for language literacy development, I, I could put that also in academic achievement because you need that to foster academic achievement, but I could also put that here in terms of high levels of cultural competency, right? I need to be able to walk in both worlds, so I need the language and vocabulary to be able to walk in both worlds. So I'm gonna put it here, principle two, language and literacy development, okay? You might disagree with me there, but, um, you know, thinking about how that, that fits and where you can make the argument for it. Um, and the same thing with, I think, uh, principle three, contextualization. I'm going to put it here in cultural competence in the sense that if you're connecting it to the student's world, you're helping them to walk in both worlds. So I'm going to put principle three, um, and that one is 
contextualization. Okay. And next one, principle four, challenging activities. It's not always just filling in the blank, um, call and response, but it's actually um, complex thinking. So principle, uh, ooh, can't seem to spell that correctly, principle, and that is principle four, which is comp challenging activities. Okay, uh, we'll put that in academic achievement. Number five, instructional conversation. Um, let's see, I'm gonna put that one here in, in cultural competence where I'm using my vocabulary and my conversation to do a talk aloud to help students see what my logic is, what my reasoning is, why I'm, I'm making these steps after those steps and I'm sharing how I get from point A to point B. So I'm gonna say that that's walking in two worlds. You, do you see how I'm making the decisions here? So principle five is instructional conversation. Okay, critical stance, I'm gonna put here in this bottom one of criticality and social consciousness. Um, those are the same thing. So critical stance, that's principle six, and it is critical stance. We're gonna look at um, our world around us and see how we can um, not only understand it, but work to make it more inclusive for all of us. Now, uh, learning through observation, um, maybe I'm gonna put that, uh, again, I might, I might put that here with cultural competence, I might put it up here with academic achievement, but I think I'm gonna put it here in the middle because I'm learning something new, a new way to do that. And so I'm learning to walk in two worlds. So I'm gonna put um, modeling through observation in that one. And then the last one is principle eight, a student directed activity. This is really where they're learning to be independent learners and that they have agency and they have choice. I'm gonna put that one here with criticality because um, this is where uh, they can choose, like, for example, I might be trying to support girls in saying, um, you can be a very um, feminine, very lovely young lady or girl and still be a scientist. And so I, I want them to be able to make their own choices and to be able to direct their own learning. So I'm going to put that um, here where they're learning to use their choices in ways that um, make the world more inclusive, even if it's only in their sphere of influence. Okay, so um, now we have our chart more filled out and you can see what I'm doing here. So you can take um, Dr. Hammond's, excuse me, you can take Dr. Hammond's Ready for Rigor and you could do the same thing all by yourself. She's got four um, components of her model and you could do the same thing as we've done together with Dr. Mohammed's, Dr. Timon's. You could do Dr. Hammond's by yourself, okay? And also you can do um, the teaching and learning for the 21st century. You could do that one by yourself too. Um, because you've seen, I've modeled it for you. I've used, um, I've used um, a talk aloud. I, I've modeled it for you. This instructional conversation, I've showed you how to do that. I've scaffolded it for you. And now you're ready to independently do that. And I'm confident that you can. Um, so this is the framework for um, the 21st century. And you see that you have things like creativity, innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration. Um, so you can decide, you know, where you want those to to um, be in here. Like I might put environmental literacy. I might put that one over here. Over here, um, in a in a criticality. I might put that one there, and I can. Um, 
and I can explain why I'm putting it there because there's a lot of debates about, um, you know, about climate change and so on. And so that's about this kind of socio-historical awareness and so on. Um, so uh, I can go through and put all of those there. Um, the one thing that I, I think often does not get taken into account very much is um, this criticality with um, the way some people interpret learning in the 21st century. They say, yes, we have to collaborate. Um, our knowledge base is changing um, um, exponentially uh, all the time at much faster paces than the knowledge base before during industrialization. So when um, uh, most of US society was farmers, and then you had the development of factories and people started leaving the farms and coming into the cities and they started um, the industrialization of the United States. Then, um, you know, you had a, a lot of, you did not have the knowledge base changing that quickly. It, they called it like the three R's, reading, arithmetic and... I forget what the what the third R was, but it kind of stayed this um, kind of concrete body of knowledge that everybody would have to learn. And then, um, you know, you went out into the world and you use that. We're in the 21st century now. Our world is very um, uh, based on technology as connecting us and the knowledge that um, students now will need as adults hasn't even been invented yet. Their professions haven't been invented yet. So the knowledge base is changing a lot. Um, so that is something that's very unique to learning in the 21st century. Uh, you gotta be a critical thinker, problem solver. The one thing that I would say is generally missing uh, or because even if they have like environmental literacy, they don't always look at these um, inequities, patterns of inequities. Like it matters um, uh, who says that um, who that is not appropriate, right? And there, that's a relationship of power about who says what is good, true, and beautiful. So sometimes you don't have that when um, uh, people are looking at at uh, the 21st century, they might think about critical environmental literacy and just put it up here in cultural competence or in um, academic achievement and not look at those relationships of, of power and patterns of inequities. So that's what makes that um, different. And then for um, the uh, Utah state standards, let me see if I have that one um, already opened. No, it doesn't look like I, I do. Um, you're gonna do the same thing as you've done here. Which standards fit with, um, with which one of those three, okay? In your core curriculum, um, some are more skills, some are more intellect, uh, some are more uh, about collaboration and interaction. And um, so where do they fit? Okay, so once I have this done, I'm really ready to take a look now at my lesson planning. And I want to be able to um, make sure that I have in my lesson plan that I have these different principles. So I don't have to have every principle for every lesson, but I should have several of them um, in, in my lesson, okay? So let me move this aside here and stop sharing my screen for just a moment and see if I can pull up a, another um, document. This is the Madeline Hunter template uh, as compared to the um, the template that um, SUU uses every day for daily lesson planning, which you'll get very familiar with. 
Okay, so um, um, just to review that, let me um, show you a little bit of about that. Um, we talked about this the last time. Um, this is the different um, components of the lesson plan. And this one looks a little different um, than the SUU one where you have an anticipatory set, an objective um, and purpose uh, input modeling. Are you starting to see how this one might connect to our chart that we just made? Checking for understanding, guided practice, independent practice, closure. Um, so already I've been using some of that terminology when I said that um, I feel that you would be able to um, work independently from here because I've used I've used instructional conversation to talk aloud how I was thinking through um, these parts of the charts and why this chart is important. And now we so we did that together. You were watching and listening to me as I was modeling it for you. And now it's if you were with me right now, I might have you be the one leading the conversation about where you think that Dr. Hammond's uh, elements would go here. And then we, so we would be doing a joint production with me supporting and guiding and scaffolding you and maybe correcting you if you are maybe heading in a direction that might not be productive. Um, but you're the one doing it with me coaching and supporting you. And then I might say, okay, now on your own, you go ahead and independently fill out the rest of this. And so that's more, um, now the scaffolding is, is taken back and now let's see if you can actually do it. Okay. And um, then I can assess whether you did, did that or not. Okay. So so you've kind of you're already seeing some of those those pieces uh, there, okay. So um, I'm gonna see if I can get a whiteboard up here for you to um, be able to um, talk you through how I would do a um, a lesson plan in using the Madeline Hunter model, okay. And let's see. Okay, whiteboard. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so I'm looking. Here's my whiteboard. Okay, so anticipatory set. I'm going to put that over here. Anticipatory set. Anticipatory set. And I like that because... um. The reason that I like anticipatory set is because this is your hook. You're trying to get students to um, hook into what you're talking about. If our lesson is on sickle cell anemia or something, then I'm trying to get the students to be interested and excited about um, what we're gonna be talking about. I'm trying to trigger their background knowledge and get them where they're leaning in and fully intent on um, what is what are we gonna talk about today? What is this? So if we go back to our um, back to our uh, food uh, lesson plan, remember we were talking about um, food here, we might um, maybe, Maybe my anticipatory set is going to be. Um, I'm gonna bring. Um, I'm gonna bring what I eat for breakfast, and I'm. I might have it on the table, and I might bring enough that we can all eat some for for um, breakfast, and kind of, and say we're gonna have a second breakfast today, and and so I'm. I'm trying to hook them in, and that's. That's fairly easy when you're talking about um, food because why not just bring the food? So that that's one thing that I could do to kind of hook them in. You know, who who likes Wheaties? You know, um, a lot of kids don't like um, cereal, a cold cereal. I know when I was a kid, I always wanted um, like Captain Crunch or something that had sugar in it, but my mom would never buy that. 
And so um, I always had to eat Wheaties or Cheerios, which I didn't really like. And so, um, you know, we can kind of compare and contrast what did what you normally eat at your house? What do you eat at your house? And so we're going to start with the learner, not the lesson plan. Um, we could also um, use maybe um, plastic fruit. We could um, have uh, maybe posters of food, what looks like breakfast food. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, uh, we might even read a short poem about, about breakfast and um, so there's lots of things that you can do to hook the students in. So that's really what you want to do is hook the students in. Tr try to try to get their um, their background knowledge. So background knowledge. What do they already know? What do they want to know? What, why might this be important to them? Um, maybe it's going to be about tortillas. Maybe you have somebody um, come in and model making tortillas. Have any of you ever seen this before? Uh, have you ever seen fry bread be made before? So you do something to kind of grab their attention. Okay. And so then, then you're going to need um, something for the uh, input input for you for your lesson right that's what we're we're talking about here for the madeline hunter we're looking at um oh we're going to put our objective and um we're going to use that uh a b c d format and there's a link on our canvas course um uh in the last module where you'll see that it says how to write a learning objective so what will the student do with what and how well? Okay, so you have to be able to measure it. So we'll put that, um, we'll put our um, learning objective here, okay? And if it's, if it's for our food lesson, maybe we want them to um, name, um, name, Maybe choose, a, create a breakfast plan that includes uh, three carbohydrates, one protein, you know, something like that. We could do that because that would go for even high school students as, as well as um, kindergartners. Uh, they, they maybe are thinking, okay, I need a fruit. I, I need some sort of a protein. What would that be? Um, if they're older, maybe they're going to be calculating like for body size um, and mass, how many calories do should I have for breakfast to, for my energy? So you see um, physical fitness right there. So your learning objective is kind of is critical because it determines what kind of input that this is the content knowledge here that um you and skills that you want to um you want them to know so this is kind of the outcome that you want and then how are you going to get there okay so let's see um the new knowledge process or skills must be presented to the students in the most effective manner this could be through discovery discussion reading listening observing so discovery usually is the one that is very effective in terms of students love this one, but it also takes more time because if you're gonna discover something, you're not gonna go directly to it. So you have to have room for some flexibility for them to make some errors and um, come to that conclusion. Um, but they definitely are often invested in that. And um, then with the modeling, how are you going to um, help the students to see what they are learning? Um, so maybe you're going to model 
okay, we decided that this is how many carbohydrates we need. This is how many proteins we need. Um, and so you've already talked about that as a class and, and about how that makes the body go. And so now you're going to maybe model. I think for my breakfast, I'm going to have, and then you model what you would choose for the breakfast and you would show um, and talk aloud about why you're going to choose that and you're modeling it and then um, talking through it. And then you're going to check for understanding. You just modeled it. You shared the input. The students know what they're supposed to do. And but check to see, are they understanding you? Um, uh, uh, do they have questions about that? Um, so you can use a variety of things to check for understanding. And sometimes I'll say, um, now what, what I'll give the instructions. Um, uh, um, so we need our professional rubric, uh, completed by Thursday at midnight. When does it need to be completed by? And then they, they tell you, you check for understanding. Yes, they understood that. The guided practice then somewhere in your lesson you're going to have um, somewhere where you're kind of coaching and, and guiding them on, um, on what their, their, um, what their, the skill knowledge or activity that you want them to do. Um, you're going to guide them. Um, sometimes when I would be teaching math um, and I wanted them to become very proficient at an algorithm, I would use red dot, green dot. And so I'd have a red marker and a green marker in my hand. And very quickly, I would just go through the class and I'd put a red dot by the, uh, if a student had a particular problem incorrect, I'd put a red dot, which would alert them to go back and look at it. If it got a green dot, that one was correct, keep going. So that was very diagnostic and I, it was guided because I was scaffolding it, giving them feedback. I had modeled it, we'd done it together, and now they're give, getting some, some practice, but I'm giving them immediate feedback. And then they're gonna do it with no help, okay? And so um, this is their independent, and I can use this as my assessment. Were they able to meet my um, a learning objective? Uh, and so how do I know that the students actually learned? Um, and then at the end, it's very important to kind of wrap it up in the sense that you say, okay, uh, today we learned about this. And for me, this is always a hard one because uh, often I run out of time and I need to do a better job pacing so that I have time for this closure. Today, we learned about this, this, and this. And so it's kind of like a summary you want it to, um, uh, you know, it says closure is not necessarily an end point, but more of a final checking for understanding. This is what we learned about. Um, and they're like, yes, if they followed it, that it was clear. And sometimes you have to go back and do a little bit of reteaching. Um, so the reason that I like this model better than, um, better than what we saw. Um, let me see if I can pull that one up. up. I like that one better than what we have um, for our um, SUU one. I mean, you still see the same, um, you still see like, here's the learning objectives, right? We had that, um, the beginning, the middle and the end. We do have that, but do you see how it's more specific in terms of in the beginning, you're gonna actually put what is your input, right? And then um, you're going to um, have in this middle, you're gonna have more like guided practice and some independent practice. And then your your closure and your summary are gonna, gonna go here. Um, but I think you just have more um, specification um, with the model that I prefer, although this one works as well, I would say the biggest thing that I see missing um, from this model would be where is that anticipatory set? Like, you know, to me, this lesson of sickle cell is very interesting 
But the way that it was presented wasn't very interesting at all. It was more like reading the textbook, filling in the vocabulary words, um, labeling some, some graphic images that had to do with the sickle cell. Um, but it, it didn't really contextualize um, a sickle cell. Like, why would kids from Utah want to know about sickle cell? But like an anticipatory set for anything like genetics, hereditary might be, um, why does my nose look like this? And other people's nose looks that way. Uh, why are my eyes blue and other people's eyes are not blue? You know, um, like I have blue eyes, but my child has these like amber eyes. Why would that be? So you kind of hook them in by thinking you can do that anticipatory set can be this contextualization where you've hooked them in because it's something that they're thinking about or they're interested in already. Or you can kind of dangle the carrot and be like, you know, this is actually pretty interesting and this is why. So, I mean, I just think that, you know, learning is so interesting just inherently, but sometimes the way people do it is very boring. Um, so I've been in actually university classes when I was an undergraduate and I was taking a geology class and it was the most boring class. And I really regret that experience because, you know, if I, as I walk around um, Cedar City, as I walk around Cedar Breaks and I go to Fiddler's Canyon Trail and I go all these places, I see that all of that knowledge is right around me, that it was from the discipline of geology. But the way that it was presented to me as a student was completely like, what has this got to do with me? And at the end of the semester, we had to identify for our final exam, they, we, a box of rocks literally was put in front of us and we had to um, identify, was this granite? What is this? Um, and it it was very difficult for me because there was no contextualization, even though I was taking that course in Utah. And so there's tons of geology everywhere around us, like so obvious. Um, I mean, obviously there's geology everywhere, but it's just like in your face in Utah as compared to like, say, Alabama, and, which is right on the, on the Gulf Coast there. And so, um, you know, that the teacher did not ever do any of that anticipatory set to hook us into our lesson. And then where was any kind of joint production? Where were the instructional conversations? Um, so all of all of those kind of things work well. So I think you can see here with this one that we use, we you do see what taught, how taught, how assessed, but it could be very much more specified. Like here in the middle, I would put like, what am I gonna do for guided practice? What am I gonna do for um, for independent practice? Um, how what are, what are my specific assessments? What if I have kids that don't speak English? Um, you know, with sickle cell and a lot of this um, biology, chemistry, things like that, it's very interesting where, let's say, um, I bring in a can of soda and I open it up. Why does it fizz? So you're actually looking at it and watching it happen. And even if you don't have all of the vocabulary for it, you still are following along with what is happening. And then you can put labels there. It can be in English and in Vietnamese or whatever it is. Um, so there's many things that can kind of scaffold it for the students, um, depending on what it is that um, you have to kind of attend to for the students. You know, some students will um, pick things up really quickly if you show it to them in manipulatives. Um, then other, because they're more concrete learners, that's me. I have trouble with kind of, if you want me to think through um, like abstract geometric shapes and things, 
I have a hard time following that. But if you actually give me a cube or something, then I can I can follow that. Um, I know with my third son, if you gave him a whole worksheet of um of uh division problems, he would be overwhelmed, could, wouldn't couldn't do it. But if you just gave it so that he only sees one row at a time, he can actually do that. And you could you could say to him, you know, um, okay, you do one, two, and three. And then when I come back around, I'm gonna do four, and then you do the next three. And and you kind of pace it like that. And um, so there's many things that you can do to kind of um, attend to each particular learner's um, needs, depending on how how they are learning. Sometimes people will say things like, well, he's a fast learner, uh, maybe a slow learner. And comments like that are not helpful. Because if you think about how little kids are, you think about like a baby. Uh, before they're sitting up by themselves. Um, so they have to be propped up. You have to kind of hold their head because their head's kind of big, it's wobbling all over. Um, and so, but eventually um, they're going to be sitting up by themselves. So at first they kind of tumble over and, and they need pillows to be propping them up. But eventually they get where their back is strong enough and their neck strong enough and they can hold their head up and they'll be able to sit there. And pretty soon they're pretty able to uh, reach things, play with things and so on. And then um, pretty soon they start crawling and, and walking. But my point here is that that they all do that. By the time they get to kindergarten, everybody tends to be walking. You know, sometimes there's some kids who aren't walking and maybe they need to have have uh, wheels. Maybe they're in a, in a wheelchair to get around, but they're generally able to hold their head up. They're able to do, unless there's some sort of a, of a medical situation, right? So my point is that, that, some kids will do it sooner. Some kids will do things later. I had one of my children was walking at nine months and another one of my children wasn't walking until they were almost two. And um, so, but by the time they all went to kindergarten, they were all walking. So people learn and develop um, in their own way. It doesn't mean that they're they're slow or or you know some of these other deficit terms that we have it just means that we all come there at our own kind of individual pace and usually that is accelerated if the learner wants to do it if they're interested in it if they see the purpose to it so a lot of times kids will say things like why do we have to learn this that is a wonderful question Teachers often don't like that question, but it's a wonderful question. Why do we have to learn this? Um, worthy of attention, because if they understand why they have to do it and they're guided and supported as how they learn it, then they're going to put much more energy into it. You can't learn it for them, but you can encourage, guide, support, um, and help them move toward learning. The more you can get their learning to be intrinsically motivated and the more independent they see themselves as, I want to learn this. Sometimes you see little kids who uh, want to do things their, themselves and they don't want their mom and dad or, or their big sister, brother, or grandma, and grandpa, or others to button their shirt for them. And you're like, man, I could do it a whole lot faster if you just let me button it. And they're like, no, I want to do it. So we, we tend to kind of try to get rid of that independence when they come to school, but that's actually a good thing. And we want to tap that so that they want to be independent uh, learners. So as I'm thinking about, um, about even this lesson plan here, um, am, I, am I using, is, does this lesson plan, does it reflect high levels of academic achievement? Does it, how does it foster um, high levels of, of uh, cultural competence of walking in two worlds? Um, a lot of times girls 
aren't that interested in, in science. So it's like, well, this is sickle cell. They might think, well, I don't, I don't care about that. Um, but yet that has, you know, biology has to do with all of us, no matter if we're two spirit people, transgender people, um, we identify as male, female, you know, human beings, this is fundamental to us. So what did I as a teacher do to hook them into that? Um, and then the so what, um, you know, issue like with sickle cell, it's very interesting um, when you think about like how that's tied to um, Africa and African-Americans tend to be the ones that have that. And um, if white people have it, which that can happen, um, why and how did that happen? Because if you look back at the roots of, of, um, of a sickle cell, um, that that there's actually that was had something to do with malaria and kind of um, people who survived malaria were able to keep that from going throughout their their bloodstream but those sickle cells were therefore part of helping to save their lives but it's also very painful if you're not getting enough oxygen to all of your body so you think about um uh, that's very interesting you've got um social studies, you know, history, um, language arts there, you've got math, you've got biology, you've got physical education. So there's many things with any lesson plan that you can do to make it contextualized to the students so that they see, wow, this pertains to me. I want to learn this. You, you grab them with that anticipatory hook and then you provide the input. This is what we're going to be learning. This is the skill. This is the, the point. And then you, you have activities where they're exploring what that means. And then they have guided practice where um, they're trying it and you're giving them feedback. And then they do it independently and you're able to say, did they learn it or do I need to reteach? Um, and then the idea of closure, let let we understand, we have a shared understanding. This is what we learned. So um, maybe we're going to do that through joint productive activity. Um, maybe we're going to do that um, uh, through something that I model. But you should have, uh, you know, at least some of these in several of these in every lesson. You don't have to have them all in every lesson, but you should have um, most of them or some of them. And if you're doing it as a unit, then you can kind of space it out. Like I say, like if it's my food unit, I might say, okay, what kind of guest speakers do we want to have um, come in? What kind of field trips do we want to go to? Maybe we're going to go to the panaderia. Okay, that would be a good place to go. Um, maybe we could go to the mill and see how they make flour. That would be a good place to go. Um, maybe we could have um, somebody who's in agriculture come and talk to us about how they grow corn. Um, maybe we could have somebody come and make tortillas for us and show us how that's done. So we have guest speakers. We could... Um, we could maybe go to a museum and see art that maybe has um, a uh, focus on food and the social aspects of food. That might be something that we could do. Uh, what kind of um, independent activities are we going to have that are age level appropriate? What kind of um, paired activities are we going to have that are age appropriate? Small group of uh, activities. Um, maybe what are the whole group activities that we're going to have. So I would do like a word web of, of that. And I would actually use drawings and make like spider connections where I'm connecting, you know, all of these ideas that I have for whole group, small group, uh, pairs, independent because um, students need time to work in all of that. I shouldn't be just having them work in whole group. Sometimes they should be working in small groups. Sometimes they should be working independently. Uh, when am I going to use instructional conversation? Am I going to use any poetry? Am I going to use any um, uh, humanities? A lot of times uh, 
role play and and modeling maybe we're going to write a cartoon we're going to write a comic book together um maybe we're going to write a play that we're going to present to the parents and community members so what i'm going to have some sort of a cumulative activity at the end of my unit to show that this is what we learned, this is what we did. Maybe our cumulative activity is that we've built up all of this um, knowledge about um, the planets. Maybe now we're going to go to the planetarium because we've studied all of this stuff and we've made uh, scale-sized uh, planets and that we put throughout our school building. And so we're super excited to go to the planetarium. Um, so we might do that. We might take for our our beginning uh, unit, maybe they're having something in the park where they've got, um, it's shark week. And we know that um, downtown the city has exhibits of like um, shark skeletons, shark teeth, and kids love that kind of stuff. Um, anything with dinosaurs, things like that. So what can I do to kind of hook them in either in the classroom with a film, with an activity, um, something to make them curious. I, I know I have done, um, we had a, speaking of food, we made a souffle with my third graders one time. We learned um, uh, some chemistry things th through baking um, our souffle. And so that I find that um, a curriculum and lesson planning are very exciting. I love to do it. The main thing to remember is that you do want to have at least some of these elements in your um, in your lesson planning each time. And let me see. So even now you could look at this um, fry bread lesson that's been tribe approved and you could say, are there joint activities in there? Um, is there some, is there contextualization? Is there higher order thinking skills in there? Um, does it address critical stance? So do you see how you can actually um, evaluate whether a lesson plan is a good one or not. I'm looking for my little uh, chart here. Um, so you can actually, let me move this over here. You can go through the lesson plan and see, does it have um, these principles here? Those should be in the lesson plan. Um, and you can see how um, Dr. Timon's match up with Dr. Mohammed's and Dr. Ladd's and Billings. That's the lens you look at to evaluate a lesson plan. And then you're adding in, um, you know, you're going to use a template, this one, and maybe you can use this one and add in what you learned from the anticipatory set and other elements from um, the Madeline Hunter uh, one. I, I'm amazed that 30 years later, it still stays in my head. It's just been embedded in my head after all of these years. So I do like that one um, better. Um, so that would be, there's lots of possibilities just with that one tiny worksheet, um, which we have explored lesson planning and curriculum planning in the way that exemplary teachers do. So again, the key thing to remembering about, um, about exemplary teachers is that they always have all three of the, of the elements. They have high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, and high levels of critical consciousness or criticality, okay? So some teachers will have the first two or just the first one, um, and they'll be missing the third. It's not exemplary teaching unless it has all three. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you for listening. And I know you are going to be an exemplary teacher.